there is a well-known British atheist philosopher. He's, I should say, he's well-known like an intellectual in the academic world. His name is Bertrand Russell. Maybe you've heard that name before. He's, he's a pretty influential guy in terms of uh, academic things. I was talking on the phone with him and he said, um, this is unusual, Dan, because I've been dead since 1970. And I said, yes, <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, now that I think of it, I wasn't talking with him. I read this somewhere and I actually forgot who it was. Colin reminded me it was Bertrand Russell, so I looked it up. And uh, he had this exchange with someone and it went sort of like this. I believe this was a woman at a, like a, a, a party or something is the way I saw it described online. And he was elderly at this time. I believe he was in his 90s at this time. And this person said to Bertrand Russell, noted atheist, if when you die, you find out that you were wrong, and well, there's a God after all, and now you're standing in front of this God whom you vehemently denied, what are you going to say to him? And Bertrand Russell said, I will tell this God, you gave us insufficient evidence. Hmm. Interesting response, isn't it? I think there's a couple of problems with that response, obviously. One is it's almost like he thinks he's going to sass God, and he ain't going to sass God. But, but the, I think the main problem with that comment is just simply that it's not true. God, you didn't give us enough evidence that's not true, and God tells us specifically in the Bible that that's not true. As a matter of fact, the passage of scripture that we're going to look at this morning sort of deals with that very question. So I'm going to invite you to take the Bible that's in front of you there, and we're going to turn to the book of Romans, where we started a series in the book of Romans, and we're going to pick up again. We're, we're still just in the first chapter, and we're, we're going to uh, look at highlights throughout the book of Romans. We're not going to look at every single verse, but this morning we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 20, we have pew Bibles with two different fonts. So depending on which Bible you're looking at, it will be one of those two pages. Book of Romans, New Testament, written by who? Paul. Paul, very good. <laughs> written by the Apostle Paul. And again, we're going to begin at verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. If you haven't, say yes. Yes. But God shows his anger. Can God get angry? Apparently he can. Do you want to be a, a, a recipient of God's anger? No, you don't. <laughs> no, no. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now look at this. This is that Bertrand Russell issue in a way. They know the truth about God. He's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature. So they have no, what's the word? Excuse, excuse no excuse for not knowing God. People have no excuse for recognizing, for acknowledging that there's a God. God has made this truth, the truth about who he is himself he's made it known so let's talk about what we find in this passage now first of all we're told that God shows his anger against these people who don't acknowledge him who don't acknowledge the truth about him in some later verses we're going to discover that part of God's anger involves basically abandoning these folks to their wickedness see they think their wickedness is going to bring them pleasure of some kind or some kind of satisfaction it won't but they'll find that out. The passage talks about how he will abandon them to their wickedness and they'll live with the consequences of their wickedness. If this is what you want to do, then, you, then you'll, you can have it that way. It won't be good. They think it'll be good. It won't be good. But I was focusing, as I was preparing this, on one of the lines in there, and I, just, I, I find this one very interesting. It said that they suppress the truth by their wickedness. So they know the truth. They know it. 
but they suppress it. How do they suppress the truth? With wickedness. So again, I'm looking at this and I'm trying to understand and I thought, let me go. You can look up these words in the, in the Greek lexicon and I'm thinking maybe that'll help me understand this a little bit better. They're suppressing it with wickedness. So I look up the word that's translated in our Bible as suppress and it's the Greek word is katako and it means kind of what you would think. It means to hold back. To, to restrain something, to, to bind something. And it's a very intentional thing. They're intentionally doing this. And then I looked up this word that's translated as wickedness, and this word is adikia in the Greek. And, and what it said about this word is, you know what's good and right and just? It's the opposite of that. What they're doing is the opposite of, it's a violation of God and God's standards and what we know to be true and right. So we could express the idea of this verse using our lexicon words, and you could kind of express it this way. What are these people doing? They're holding back and they're restraining the truth. They're, they're binding the truth about God in their hearts by doing the opposite of what's good and right and just. They're restraining what they know to be true by intentionally, this is on purpose, violating God's standards. Have you ever heard the idea of somebody violating their conscience over and over again? They know it's wrong, but they keep doing it. They know it's wrong, but they keep doing it. And after a while, it kind of gets a little bit easier. The conscience is still there, but you keep doing it, and it gets a little easier to do this thing that you know is wrong. You've heard of that before, right? The Bible talks about this uh, as like hardening your heart. Your heart can get hard. Again, the conscience is still there, but it's being, re it's being uh, suppressed. It's being restrained by con this continual violation of God's standards. Does that sound like it'd be a good thing? Not good. Not good. So it goes on in the verse 19, and it says, so they're doing that. And it tells us, because actually the truth of God is obvious to them. They know it. They know it. Everybody you know knows the truth of God in their heart. The passage says God has made it obvious to them. I want to ask you something, and, I'm, and, I, and I really mean this seriously. I want you to think about this. Like, what do you really think is true? Is the truth about God, here's the word, obvious. Is it obvious? The truth about God is obvious. Think about that for me. I know we're in church here, and you know you're supposed to say, yes, it is. Yeah, the truth of God is that you're supposed to say that. I know that, you know that. I want you to think in your heart, what do you really believe? Just between you and God. Does that appear to be correct to you? Is it an accurate statement to say, the truth of God is obvious? I'm asking us to consider this because I think it's very likely that you and I know some people, in fact, I'm quite certain I know some people who would say something like this. They would say, like if I said to them, I'm thinking of a couple of very specific people, if I said to them, the truth of God is obvious, I think they would probably say to me, no it isn't, Dan. I know you believe that, Dan. You, 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 you embrace that, fine, that's good for you, but it isn't obvious. They would tell me, no, it isn't obvious. You know anybody like that? I bet, I think it's likely that you do. I thought about this a lot as I was preparing the message. Now, of course, it is true that the truth of God is obvious. It is true, why? Because God says so. He, he provided us this in his revealed word, so we know that it is true. But I want to think about this a little bit more. Because like I say, I, I think there are people who would, who, would, who would say, no, it's not. So let's think about this. How is it obvious? Well, the truth of God is obvious. Okay, how? And by the way, however it's obvious, this would have to be true for all people throughout all of human history. Not just today. When we say it's obvious and we tell how it's obvious, this would have to be true for people 5,000 years ago, too. So how is it obvious? Well, in the text, 
It gives us a little help. It refers to the earth and the sky and everything God made says it's obvious. It kind of basically says, look around. Look, go outside, look, look up in the sky. It's obvious. Okay. Here, in fact, here's the passage. After it tells us that it's obvious, it says this. We, we read it. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. Look around. It's obvious. Okay. I look up at the sky, and the truth of God is obvious. I think I still have some people who would say, how? I'm looking at the same sky you're looking at, Dan. How's it obvious that there's a God if, I just, if I'm looking up at the sky? I would suggest there are two factors that play a role in making, they're simple, but they make a role, in, they play a role in making God obvious. If you just, we'll just use the sky. You could do this with other things too, but we'll just talk about looking up at the sky. Two factors. Order and precision would be one. And the second one would be like the size, the vastness of it all. So let, let me explain this a little bit. Again, we're looking up at the sky. It's obvious that there's God. First, order and precision. There's an order, a regularity about what we see in the sky. And again, this would have been visible to people 5,000 years ago too. Matter of fact, there are records of astronomical, written records of astronomical observations that go back thousands of years. Written records. People have been looking at the sky for a long time and like writing things down and, and, and uh, looking at it very seriously and carefully. We know that, that uh, the wise men in the story of Jesus' birth, they had some type of knowledge of, of astronomy. So people for, forever have been looking up at the sky and noticing that there's this order and there's this precision to it, this regularity to it. And, and it's noticeable. Again, everybody can see this. So, there's an order, there's precision, but add this. Again, just what people know just from regular life experience. When things are left alone, what tends to happen to them? If they're not maintained and, and, and people don't take care of it, what happens? In nature, it just breaks down, right? What, I mean, things that are left alone, if it's not intentionally maintained, it, uh, it rots. It rusts. It breaks down. We all know that. If it's not fixed, that, that, that they wear out. Things that are not intentionally maintained move from order to disorder. They knew it back then. We know it today. Matter of fact, we have, we have a law. The, the second law of thermo, thermodynamics says this. As one goes forward in time, the net entropy, that's the degree of disorder, of any isolated or closed system will always increase. That's a fancy way of saying this. Things move from order to disorder. So you got this big, vast sky up there that's very regular. It's pre there's this great precision. And that usually requires some help or some maintenance or else it breaks down. That sets up the second factor. The size or the vastness of it all. It's pretty big, isn't it? You ever read any of these books where they'll talk about the size of the universe or how far it is from here to, to Neptune or something like that? And the numbers are so vast. Like you can't even get your head around it. Like, like, like it'll have a number and you know to the power of a thousand, which means like it's the number and not a thousand zeros. You, our minds can't. It's it's literally not figuratively. It's literally mind-boggling how vast this is. But again, even if you were a shepherd in Bethlehem a couple thousand years ago, you knew it was vast. You're sitting, up, you're sitting out there in Bethlehem a couple thousand years ago and you look up at the sky and you see this. Imagine how you could see the stars then without the lights of the city. Imagine what they would see. I can imagine someone sitting there. In fact, the psalmist write about this kind of thing, like the size, the vastness. It's breathtaking. So again, you got these two factors now. 
And, and remember, nothing fancy here. You don't need telescopes to see this. It doesn't need any modern technology. There's an order and a precision with what's going on with these amazing vast bodies up in the sky. That requires order. It requires someone to keep it from breaking down, someone to, keep, to maintain it. Then you add this. Whatever would be the power that's keeping this all together and sustaining this and everything would be indescribable. What kind of power does that? What kind of power can keep all this together? Who's doing this? And God's response is, isn't it obvious? Here I am. Hey, can you look at the world around you and you just see the reality of God? If you can't, According to our passage, you're suppressing it. People can see it's there. It's there to see. Are you with me? Yes. Was that a little too technical or were you able to follow it? Because I'll pare it down at 11 if it, but is that, was that follow, were you able to follow? Okay, good, good. Because I pared it down twice already. I thought, now this is going to... And so that was the two pared down version. That's followable. Say yes or no. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I've been approaching this. We've been talking about it primarily in a way so far today from an intellectual standpoint. Because I've tried this week to imagine how can a person, just any person, just with their thinking and their reasoning, how could they come to see that the truth of God is obvious? I was thinking about that a lot. And, and I think there's, a, there's an intellectual component to us. God gave us minds. He gave us, God gave us this ability to think and reason. These are good and important gifts. And they definitely, they play a role in what these verses are communicating to us. We're, we're, it's talking about thinking. However, I'm also very much aware that there's a spiritual component to this too. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. When we're told that the truth of God is obvious, I think part of what happens to make this obvious to us is a work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's not just a thought. It's, it involves intellect and reason and careful observation, but there's a Holy Spirit factor here too. Matter of fact, I think we can say this as a general rule of thumb. Any work of God in our lives is going to involve the Holy Spirit. I think we can take that to the bank. You know, I told you guys before about a friend of mine from long ago, and uh, it's a long story, I won't go into the whole story again, but the, the short version is he was just kind of minding his own business one day. He wasn't a believer, and he was just like in a moment overwhelmed by the complexity and the wonder of the world. And again, I, I don't even know that he believed in God at this, at this point in time in his life. But he just, he was awestruck one day. Very, very smart guy. And, and in his case, I believe there was an intellectual component. But I remember him telling me about this. This was many, I was a teenager when he told that he was a young adult and I was a teenager. And I, there was a God factor too. There was an intellect factor. But this aha moment that he had, that happened for him, it wasn't just reason and intellect, it was the Holy Spirit at work in his life. And he recognized this, and that began his move towards, towards God, and, and he accepted Christ and became a Christian. Um, great guy. And again, my point is this, God has told us that he's made the truth about himself obvious. We read it, right? It's obvious. And I think there's an intellectual component to this. Absolutely. But there is also a work in our hearts. It's like a work of wonder and awe in our hearts. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. And that's a factor too. And again, if people are denying it, no way, I don't see it, uh -uh, fooey on all that stuff. They're denying the work of the Holy Spirit then as well. Hey, has the Holy Spirit revealed the truth about God to you?
Maybe he is right now. That would be good. Yes? yes? By the way, if he is, respond and say yes. God has revealed himself to you and me, to everyone we know. You and I probably know some people who say, I'm an atheist. God has revealed himself to that person. There's a God, and we all know it. Now that truth can be, so, so we read it, it can be suppressed, it can be restrained. People can push it down and block it out, but in our heart of hearts, we know there's a God. Yes, we do. He's loving and he's gracious. Thank you, Lord. But we are accountable to him. We don't get to determine moral truth based on our feelings or the cultural standards of the moment or the cultural standards of the United States. That's not what determines it. It's determined by God. And we're accountable to him. He's patient and kind. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's not his desire that any should perish. That's what the Bible says, thank you. But we're accountable to him. He has made a way of salvation for us. Thank you. We're accountable to him, and we're, we're accountable to how we respond to him. He's made it known. He knows everything. He knows everything. He knows everything about you. Every, every single detail. He knows every secret action you've taken in your life that nobody else knows about. He knows every thought. We can't fool him. Don't think you can fool him. Please don't think that. Because you can't. Please. I'm talking to myself too. So nobody... Our passage of Scripture, this is a very helpful passage of Scripture. No one is ever going to have an excuse for not knowing Him. No one can stand before God and say, Hey, you didn't give me enough evidence. God's going to say, Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And He'll know those times in that person's heart when the person could see it and sense it and they pushed it down. He'll know. So, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters, let us, let us embrace the truth of this wonderful, awesome, glorious God who loves us and cares for us. Amen? Amen. Would you stand, please? Next week, oh man, we're continuing. And the title, the Book of Romans still, Trading the Truth of God for a Lie. This is a, a, one of the lines from the text. They traded the truth of God for a lie. People can do that. We see it in our culture all the time, actually. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Oh, man, this is going to be good. This is going to be very good. Now, our wonderful, dearly beloved Rose is in the hospital right now. She's not here to pray with us. She had some breathing, respiratory issues, and she's in the hospital. And so... Um, She's a prayer warrior for all of us all the time. I think it'd be good for us to pray for Rose, yes. wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, so let's do that as, as part of our closing prayer. She would normally be standing right there, and, uh, and we love her so much. And we want her to be well. Yes? yes? Yeah. So, bow your heads if you would, please. Lord Jesus, we thank you for... Well, we thank you, Lord, for making yourself known to everyone. Thank you for revealing yourself because we need you. Everyone needs you. And so you've made yourself known to everyone. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray. We, we, you said in your word, it's not your desire that anyone would perish. We agree. We pray that everybody that we know and love would see this and recognize this and turn to you. Use us, Lord, if that's, if that's part of your plan, use us in their lives to help them see you and respond to you. Every one of us in this room, I'm, I think is probably true. I don't know everybody, but you do, Lord. And people, people that are watching online, we have friends and loved ones who, who don't know you. And we want them... We want them to come to a saving faith in you. We want them to put their trust in you and, and, and experience the, the truth of your salvation and eternal life with you. We want that for ourselves 
but we want that for everyone that we know too, Lord. So help us. Help us to be instruments for you. Lord, we lift our dear sister Rose before you. We love her so much. You know precisely what the matter is. We pray that you bring healing to her. If that means you work through the medical doctors, that's fine. We're, that's good. But uh, we know she's laying in a room right now, in a bed right now somewhere. We know you could heal her in this moment. And um, we, we rejoice in your power and who you are. We ask for your hand upon her. Lord, all of us have things, issues, requests. You know the requests, the issues that are on the hearts of every person right now who's hearing my voice. We lift those before you. We ask for your help, your comfort, your healing, your strength, your peace. Give us your peace, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. God bless.